us now enter into worship by turning to God in prayer. God of mercy, have mercy on us. God of wisdom, illumine our minds. God of light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, deliver us from evil. God of power, be our refuge and strength, now and forever. Amen. And now those of you who are able, please stand for our responsive call to worship, uh, led by Taylor. I chose you and appointed you, says the Lord, to, to go, go and bear fruit, fruit, fruit that will last. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim God's handiwork. Let us join our voices with the voice of creation in declaring God's glory. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, When the Lord Redeems the Very Least, number 852, in the hymnals, verses 1, 3, and 4. before the one who already knows our errors and is gracious to forgive our hidden faults. Loving God, you have planted us like a vineyard on a fertile hill. You cleared away the stones, planted us with choice vines, and kept watch over us by night and day. But we have not yielded the good fruit that you expected or desired. We are overgrown with sin, choked with violence and injustice. Forgive us, we pray. Uproot our evil, prune away our sin, and shower upon us the gift of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Righteousness does not come from our own doing or not doing. Righteousness comes from God by faith. Through the faithfulness of Christ, our Lord, we are forgiven. we 
holding a couple of things here. Uh, these aren't the real things, but they look like them. What, what's that? Banana. A banana. About, uh, what about that? Kaylin, you know what that is? A pear. A pear. Getting hungry yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, pineapple. Up close. Cantaloupe. Cantaloupe. Very close. Very close. <coughs> and last but not least, grapes. 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 Very good. What do, what do all of those foods have in common? Fruit. They're fruit. They're fruit. But they're not real fruit. They're not real fruit. No, but they but they look like real. You know, Jesus actually talked about fruit quite a bit. When he spoke in parables, uh, when he told stories about God's kingdom, he often talked about fruit. We talked a couple weeks ago about a vineyard. What, which one of these things grows in a vineyard? No, nope, not a tomato. The grapes. Grapes grow in a vineyard. That, that was a story we had about two or three weeks ago. And actually, Jesus told a couple of stories about a vineyard. And we're, we're going to actually hear about another one. Because Jesus, when he talked about fruit, he was always talking about the things we did, the actions that we did. And that when we did the good things that God wants us to do, it's like producing good fruit. Do you like good grapes? Pears, tomatoes, bananas? We really like good fruit. It tastes good. It helps us. It helps our bodies grow and develop. It's the same thing with God's kingdom. It needs fruit, too, to help people to grow and develop into the people God wants them to be, uh, which is why Jesus often talked about producing good fruit. Well, in the story we are going to hear today, in fact, in just a few moments, talks about a vineyard that God owned and some people rented out the space to actually grow the grapes, but when the grapes were ready to be picked and harvested, and God sent his servants to collect those, the people who were growing the grapes wouldn't give them up. Have, have you... I don't know why some grapes are red. Sometimes they're green, sometimes they're real dark purple. I don't know. They're all just different types of grapes, but they're all very, very good. Well, how would you feel if you had a bunch of grapes, and they were your grapes, but when you asked to have them back, the person who had them wouldn't give them to you? Would you be happy? No. Yeah. Oh, you'd yeah. be pretty mad and be pretty upset uh, because they belong to the one who owns the vineyard, and the vineyard in that story is God's vineyard, which is is all the world yet yeah, and very very sad so jesus told tells this story to remind us not only are we supposed to produce good fruits but we're supposed to share them as well so all the good things we do we don't do just to be good people we do them to share god's blessings with everyone else so before you guys go back to your seats and before i take these for disinfecting will you please pray with me Bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for helping us to live lives to produce good fruit. Help us to not only produce that fruit, but also to share it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. That can be found on page 981 of your pew Bible or on the screens behind me. Uh, I'll read the first uh, portion of the verse as well as the odd verses, uh, and you, the congregation, will respond with the even verses starting with verse 6. But before we read together God's word, let us first pray for God's wisdom. God of all wisdom, give us your word and send us your spirit so that we may know Christ. Amen. And beginning now in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4b. 
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21 verses 33 through 46. Listen again for God's word. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Years ago, I had a friend that had a interesting poster. It was in a frame on his wall. Had a picture of a very large mansion on it and lots of expensive possessions, uh, sports cars, helicopters, uh, things like that. The caption underneath the poster read, he who dies with the most toys wins. Now the really interesting point is if you knew this guy, his personality, it was actually a very ironic statement because he was and still is one of the most generous and giving people I have ever met. But the reality is, like many signs that have added to this sentiment, it is that we still die. And despite this image, we can't take it with us when we go. At the same time, there are things that we need for ourselves, for our families, things that we want, things that come into our possession. What do we do with that stuff? What use do we make of those sorts of toys? What we do with them matters in the Christian life. 
and how we understand it, where these things come from, who owns it, what we ought to do with it, that's all tied up with this notion of stewardship. Stewardship is the season we have been in and will continue to be in. It's one marked by, among other things, pledge cards. And as said earlier, those pledge cards will be coming to a mailbox close to you very, very soon. But stewardship is more than just a pledge card. It's more than just money. It concerns itself with the stuff of life. What do we do with those things, that stuff, our abilities, our skills, our time? It implies this notion of stewardship, this importance we place on it in the church, that we are, in fact, supposed to do something with that stuff. Jim Carroll, the author of the autobiographical account, The Basketball Diaries, writes about being told how much of a crime, a shame, a disappointment it was to have wasted talent. He was, before his death a few years ago, an incredibly gifted poet, writer, he was a noted musician, and during the 1960s, when he was a teenager growing up in Manhattan, he was one who seemed destined for a great career in basketball. The novel and the subsequent movie based upon it demonstrates what wasted talent or wasted potential looks like, at least in the form of an addiction to heroin. It nearly took his life multiple times, the things he did to support his habit, the pit his life descended into that is told in this account, the getting and finding ways and means to get more. All this talent, all this potential he had, it all fell by the wayside so that he could pursue these other things, living up to the idea of wasted talent. That is until he struggled and eventually overcame his addiction and returned, while not to basketball, to writing, to poetry, and to musical expression, writings and music that have influenced profoundly many for generations. Now, most of us do not need to descend quite to those levels or depths to understand what poor stewardship looks like. We want it all. We want everything. And we think everything really is ours. It's kind of like Daffy Duck. Daffy Duck of all the Looney Tunes really sums up this idea. In several of the Looney Tunes cartoons, he hoards up things that he comes into possession. When he sees Bugs Bunny or someone else, he has a way of yelling at them, hands off, it's mine, 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 mine. And we laugh when Daffy goes down these trails because we can relate to that. We know someone or ourselves have been that one shouting, mine, 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 mine. We forget or perhaps have never realized that everything we have in this life really is just on loan to us. This is something reiterated to us this morning in our gospel reading from the closing verses of Matthew chapter 21, parable of the wicked tenants as it's become known. So just like a few weeks ago, in fact, if as I was reading this, you said, wait a minute, this sounds familiar. Didn't we hear about a vineyard a few weeks ago? We did. That was in Matthew chapter 20. And actually, that kind of helps us a little bit. Because a lot of the players, a lot of the symbols going on in this parable are exactly the same. The owner of the vineyard is still God. The vineyard itself is still, at least in Jesus' time, would have been understood as Israel. In our day, the people of God, the kingdom of God, the work is still the same, growing and cultivating fruit for the kingdom. There are people at work, but rather than people coming at different times of the day and all being paid the same wage, this time the owner is not there to oversee things. The owner is away on a journey, but when the harvest time comes, as it does every year, we know that in this part of the world, it's, it's harvest time. Farmers are out in the field cutting beans, harvesting the corn, bringing all of that in. During that time, we go and we gather that harvest. It was time in the vineyard. The grapes were ripe. They were ready to be picked. 
So the owner, so God sent ones, representative of the prophets, the messengers of God to say, hey, now is the time. Let's, let's bring these fruits to where they belong. And the son, there was no son in that first one, but if I really have to explain who the son is, particularly if God is the owner, who the owner's son is, we, we get that one, right? That, that, that one's not too hard. Jesus uses, though, these parables, these allegories, these stories, almost like going into a house through the side door. I had a conversation recently with a colleague or mentor, or colleague and mentor of mine, and we were talking about this notion that when we address things directly and head on, when we try to enter by the front door, it's very easy to prevent someone or something from coming in the front door. We can turn the knob lock, we can latch the deadbolt, we can take the chain, we can put that on there, we can put other locks on that, and we can guard it really well. Cannot come in this way. Sometimes, especially with the things of God, we need to come in sideways, come in through the side door. There's not so many locks there usually. There's not so many defenses. Illustrations in sermons, at least when they work, often function in the same way. They don't address something directly. And that's what Jesus was doing in all of these parables. He was addressing very serious things, but in a very indirect way. So that by the time the people's minds caught up and said, oh, wait a minute, I know what's going on here. It's too late to shut that out. It's too late to say, I'm not listening, I'm not paying attention. Now, it's really not about the messenger. It's really not about the means of getting in. It is about that message because a messenger really is only as successful, after all, if the message is actually delivered. Using the side door, Jesus gets that message through more often than not. More than this, though, using the image of a vineyard had very real meaning and significance in ancient Israel. Going back to one of Israel's greatest prophets, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 5 of the book of Isaiah to be precise. When Jesus starts talking about a vineyard, especially those religious leaders, that's immediately where their mind goes. Wait a minute, we've heard about a vineyard. We've heard about God's vineyard before. Isaiah told us about that long ago. It was a way of telling an old story in a new way. But again, by the time their minds caught up and said, wait a minute, we are the tenant farmers. Wait a minute, we are the ones that the land is least. Oh, he's talking about us. It was too late for those chief priests and Pharisees. It's too late even for us. They knew what that text said in Isaiah. They knew what Jesus was saying to them in that moment. He was talking about them, the ones that ought to know better. Using the side door, Jesus got in, delivered this message about stewardship to them and to us. Because this is about the stuff of God, the fruit of God's kingdom and what we do with that fruit. So our first lesson to take away, whoever we are in this story, whoever we identify, there are two people we definitely are not in this story. And that is the landowner and the son. We are not God. We are not Jesus. Not by a long shot. This vineyard, it belongs to God. This world, it belongs to God. The inheritor is not us. It is his son, Jesus Christ. Everything we have truly and rightly belongs to God. Now, John Calvin, the intellectual head of the Reformation, the father of the Reformed tradition, a character who makes for a very cute bobblehead that you can see in my office, noted two other things about this specific parable of Jesus. First, that the gospel, wherever it is proclaimed, wherever it is read, wherever it is heard, wherever it is understood, especially wherever people try to live their lives by this good news, it will be resisted. We have lots of ways to resist this in our own day and age. There's atheism ever on the rise. I just don't believe in God or Jesus. It doesn't make sense. I have no use for that. Or maybe something not quite as stark and oppositional, maybe something even more damaging though. 
insignificance. Yeah, God's, God's a pretty good guy. Jesus really liked Jesus. Oh, he's a great teacher. He, he did some really neat things. He was a great person. Oh, what happened to him was terrible and awful. But, you know, really, I don't really need them. I don't really need to think about them or what they mean for us. They don't really mean anything. This life of faith, I don't really need it. I can do fine on my own, especially all that stuff about being self-sacrificing and giving and serving others. And I just don't have time for that. Or we go after the bales or the false idols in our world. And what is a false idol? It is anything that we put primacy, anything that we put before God that we say is more important than God. It can be anything, a person, a place, a thing, an idea. If you remember grade school, English class, yes, anything that's a noun, we can make that into an idol. And we can do that pretty quick. Or what about all of the violence going on in this story? Actually, when you read this parable and you hear about all of these things that these tenant farmers did, this is a very violent story. They killed one, they beat another, they stoned another, when the landowner sent more, they did the exact same thing. When the sun came, they threw him out, killed him. There's a lot of death, a lot of violence going on in here, but we almost don't even hear it. In response to the violence we see in our own lives, this is actually pretty tame. We live in a society that is either immune to violence or numb or, at worst, actually glorifies violence says it's a good thing. We buy into the message, the only way to combat and defeat violence is to have more and superior violence in response. But Jesus said something different, because that idea is not new. That idea was around in Jesus' time. In fact, in all of the prophecies of the Messiah, it was believed when the Messiah comes, he was going to ride into Jerusalem on a war horse because the Messiah was going to be this great military leader that finally, finally was going to deal once and for all with all of the enemies of Israel. Now it's interesting, Jesus did deal once and for all with all the enemies of God's people. But he didn't do it from the back of a war horse or with a sword. He rode in on a donkey and proclaimed a message of peace. Ah, but who needs that? That's not fun. That won't sell newspapers. What is it, or what it tells us, this parable, is that the resistance the gospel faces can take many, many forms, but the tenants, those who resist it most strongly, are the ones on the inside, the ones who ought to know better. Resistance is an inside job. The resistance begins and ends with us. We know, for we who should know the clearest that these things of life are not really our things, they're just on loan, we're to use them for God's glory, for God's purpose, but we live exactly the opposite of that. It's my stuff, for my benefit, for my glory, for my enjoyment. Can we really blame those outside of the church for living that way when we live very much the same way inside the church. It's all about us. The second point that Calvin raises in this reading is that in spite of whatever resistance the gospel faces from us, in spite of whatever we do with stuff, however with it we are with the program or not with it, the end is always going to be the same. In the end, God will be victorious. No amount of resistance will stop God's purposes. Using verses from the same psalm that was sung when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and in Matthew's gospel, that account took place a few chapters before this parable. So this is during that last week. Jesus has already come in. They've already waved the palm branches. They've already shouted Hosanna, words from Psalm 118. Jesus uses that exact same psalm and says, haven't you heard, haven't you read don't you know that in the end, the very one you are rejecting is 
He's the one that is going to be elevated above everything. He's going to be the one that holds things together. That is the purpose of a chief cornerstone, the top cornerstone. Two walls that stand in opposition are held together, held together by it. That rock on which they stumble today will be the rock on which they break. The question is, how much do we need to be worn down? How much do we need to be crushed in our lives to let go of these things? Because it all will be taken from us. All of our pride, all of our ego, all of our need for power, all of our prejudice, all of that will be gone. How long will we hold on to that and be held back by that? That's what stewardship is about. Realizing we can't let it go if we hold on to it with a clenched fist. Holding on to what's not really ours. Holding on to the thing that holds us back. In the country of India, for a number of reasons, they have need for a particular type of trap. Not a mouse trap, but a monkey trap. You might wonder, how exactly does one go about trapping a monkey? Glad you asked. Monkey traps are deceptively simple, and they are very appropriate, I think, as a closing illustration today. Monkey traps work by knowing how a monkey thinks, how a monkey processes information, and what a monkey really values. They love food. So, how do you trap a monkey? The way that this is typically done is one would take a coconut and either cut it in half or maybe just drill a hole in it just large enough for a monkey to fit its hand in. And you scoop out all of that stuff in there and you cook some rice, monkeys love rice, and you stuff that coconut with rice. And then you put a trap over that, something that the monkey can reach through but that the coconut cannot come out with. So what happens when this trap is set? There's rice in the coconut, the monkey smells the rice, the monkey comes, hey, there's rice, there's free rice. Hey, look, there's no one around. That's my rice now, the monkey thinks. And the monkey puts its hand in and it grabs a big fistful of rice. But then it can't get its hand out of the coconut. Deceptively simple to trick a monkey. As long as that monkey holds on to that rice, it cannot get its hand out of that coconut, cannot get its hand out of that trap. The monkey simply cannot see how its desire for the thing that doesn't actually belong to it is actually keeping it trapped. It would rather stay stuck with a fistful of rice it can't even eat rather than let it go have its freedom. Now, if we see a picture of a monkey doing this, and we might think, stupid monkey. But I ask you, do any of us look any less stupid with the things we hold on to and refuse to let go of? We may look down on addicts like Jim Carroll, who held on with both hands to the very thing that was destroying him, the reality is we all have our own addictions, the, our own things, our own dependencies, our own enslavements, our own fistfuls of rice we just will not let go no matter what. Can't figure yours out? What is that one thing that is more important that you have than God? When you figured that out, you've got it. That's it right there. And that thing is not yours anymore then those grapes in that analogy of the vineyard belong to those who grew it, or that a fistful of rice belongs to a monkey. It's on loan. What we do with it, what we do with that fruit that we are called to produce in the vineyard, what we do in our life, how we make use of what's on loan to us, how we pass it on to others, that matters. So my final words to you today never, ever once thought I would ever say this in church, but it does fit today. Don't be a monkey. <laughs> Don't be a monkey. Give to God what is God's. Amen? Amen. As 
we respond to God's word today, we do so uh, as always in song. I invite those of you who are able to stand as we sing hymn number 761, called as partners in Christ's service. And we'll sing verses one, two, and three. Please be seated. As we come to our time of prayer, a uh, few needs and concerns. Uh, we certainly pray for uh, the victims of a horrific act of violence and evil in Las Vegas last Sunday evening, Monday morning, uh, for all of those killed um, and multiple times that, that were injured in that attack. We pray for them, for their healing, for their wholeness. Uh, we especially pray for the men and women of law enforcement that responded selflessly and completely uh, to end that attack, as well as the many everyday unsung heroes that came to complete strangers' aid in that. Uh, we pray for them this day. We. Uh, pray for those impacted by uh, the fourth hurricane now to make landfall in the United States. I believe Hurricane Nate is now a tropical storm somewhere in northwestern Alabama, I believe. Um, definitely not as destructive as some of the earlier storms this season, but certainly a very powerful and dangerous storm. So we pray for all in the path of that storm, as well as those left in its aftermath. Uh, for those who uh, have been following the prayer chain, we've been praying uh, for the last several weeks for Robert Dottel. Uh, he's the grandfather of Michael Denning. Uh, he did pass away yesterday um, after suffering uh, multiple strokes. Um, graveside memorial service will be tomorrow. Uh, so we lift up Mike and Trudy uh, and all of Robert's family as they mourn his loss and passing. Uh, we pray uh, Thanksgiving for Chili Fest, a good and bright spot that is shine, 
shined on our community uh, each and every year. Uh, we pray for safety uh, in all of those who come to share in some good food and good fun. Uh, also ask you to uh, pray for my Uncle Bud. Um, he uh, has been sick for the better part of this last year and has undergone about eight months of medical testing, uh, all of which have shown uh, everything he is not suffering from. Uh, still not able to see what it is, um, but he is uh, not doing very well. So I ask for your prayers for him and for the continued testing he undergoes. Uh, also for Taylor's Uncle Derek, uh, who will have his cancer treatments extended, uh, ask your prayers for him as well. Are there other needs and concerns or even joys and blessings we would share with each other and God this morning? Nancy. For Sandy Bell, someone we've prayed for quite extensively, uh, uh, return of her cancer. Prayers for her. Seeing and hearing no others, let us carry these things as well as what remains in our hearts and minds to prayer. And as we pray, uh, we will pray responsively. As I lead God of hosts, we will all respond with, hear our prayer. So now let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, God of hosts, restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. For your beloved chosen people, the vine that you brought out of Egypt, God of hosts, for the church of Jesus Christ, your beloved son, God of hosts, for martyrs, saints, and prophets, persecuted for doing your will. God of hosts, for all who are suffering through sickness or oppression, God of hosts, for the coming of your kingdom with justice and peace for all, God of hosts, for those things that we have named already and those things we name to you now in silence. God of hosts, turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, have regard for your people through Christ, the vine in whom we are the branches. We pray as he taught, saying, our Father. standing for our sending hymn number 846 fight the good fight we'll sing verses 1 3 and 4 
Beloved, forget what lies behind, look for what lies ahead, and press on toward the goal, the heavenly call in Christ Jesus. And now may the face of God shine upon you so that you might be saved, and may the grace of God live within you through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen.